Hi, my name is Steven. Welcome to my life surviving schizophrenia. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'm here with my dad today. I'm Steve, Steve is dad. And we will be going more in depth about my psychosis. So last week, Steven did a video on psychosis, War of the Gods. So this was a delusional belief Stephen had when he had his psychotic break, which was in January of 2012. And the hospitalization again was in May of 2012. So psychosis is a symptom of schizophrenia. And psychosis involves either delusions and or hallucinations. So what Stephen described in the video last week, in the war, psychosis, the war among the gods, was a delusional belief that he had, yes. um, not an hallucination. Although Stephen has had both delusions and hallucinations. I definitely have had both. So we're going to go into this video discussing primarily um, the onset of Stephen's psychosis. And the, the onset was in January 2012. And how that developed up until the time he was hospitalized and through the hospitalization, which was, uh, he was hospitalized again May 17th, 2012, and discharged on May 31st, 2012. So we're almost 10 years yeah, past that time, years. right? It's been about 10 years. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, we have received a number of comments uh, about and one recently about hallucinations, whether Stephen had any, I believe it was auditory, uh, auditory hallucinations. Um, and again, I think that what's going to happen is that Stephen, the following week, will do a video, he's planning a video on hallucinations? Yes, I plan to make a video about my experience with my hallucinations and go into more depth about that then. Okay. Um, and so then on this video, it's dad's perspective on psychosis. Yes, this is my dad's perspective. But it's more narrowly focused on delusions. Yes. Right, which is again a symptom of psychosis. And psychosis is a symptom of schizophrenia, among many other illnesses. We have this well documented, and I want to uh, take a look here at a, this is a psychological evaluation. It was conducted by a um, clinical psychologist with a uh, psych D, and that is a um, doctorate degree in psychology. So this is a uh, evaluation of Stephen. Uh, dates of testing were April 6th, 9th, 12th, and 23rd of 2012. So again, this is uh, a month prior to the hospitalization. And it has helped refresh our recollection. We don't sure. look at this very often. Um, so we printed this out, and uh, I'm going to read some of this. Reasons for referral for testing and presenting problems. Stephen was referred for a psychological evaluation by his psychiatrist and was brought in for testing by his parents to better understand his psychological function, functioning. His parents reported that Stephen had a mental breakdown and is exhibiting delusional thoughts. This began after he had a head-like flu that began in late January 2012. At school, Stephen reported that he thought he was, quote, going crazy, and told his classmates such. Within seven days of his delusional thinking, he had started going to the nurse complaining of head headaches. This is the nurse at school. He first went to the emergency room on March 6, 2012, because of his headaches, and he had last, that had lasted for four weeks. So he went, he went to the emergency room on March 6, 2012, and that was the local emergency room here. And I remember they, uh brought me and then they gave me morphine. It didn't know what else would work. I had headaches. Maybe the morphine would help. <laughs> it didn't. Right. So that was a, that was a uh, local hospital. That was not UCLA. It was a local hospital here in, in Los Angeles County. Um, specifically, Stephen reported uh, to his parents that he, Stephen, felt like nothing mattered and that school didn't matter. He had lost his sense of reality and Stephen told his father that he, his father, is not his father any longer. This report, this is the psychological evaluation report um, by the Psych D. Uh, his parents hope that by bringing Stephen in for an evaluation, they will better understand his psychological functioning. They welcome any strategies or suggestions to improve his current level of functioning. 
they described his areas of strength as good-hearted, kind, focused, determined, spiritual, good and loyal friend, patient with cousins and younger children, goes with the flow with friends and family. So yeah, a lot of that, I guess, <laughs> was very traumatic, so I don't even remember, <laughs> remember that, wow. Right, so this was the psychological testing that took place um, here locally, four different occasions. Do you remember the psychological testing? That... Not, not very well. Mm -hmm. I vaguely remember a beige room, and I believe I had to walk in a straight line. Okay, That's interesting. all I remember. Do you remember taking any um, psychological tests, looking at not that. pictures or anything? Or No. Just no, it's all gone. So in the observations mental status portion of this um, evaluation, or report rather, it says Stephen appears to be well kept. Again, this is April, uh, four sessions in April of 2012. Stephen appears to be well kept, well nourished, and in some distress. He appeared to be concerned about his fatigue and his level of pain. His effect was flat and he frequently reported being in pain. His energy was low and he struggled with concentrating and completing tasks. He reported visual hallucinations. His, inabil his ability rather, to sustain effort is weak. His motivation and willingness to do work were high because he was hopeful to find a reason for his symptoms. So this is what you know, the psych psychologist is writing in the report that she observed during the during this psych D testing. He was fully oriented to place and person, but not time. His mood was not congruent to the situation and was flat. So this is consistent with what we um, recall. It was January that Stephen developed uh, a delusional belief that in this in the system of gods, that he was part of um, that system, and and actually was a slave to an evil god, and at this point there was I thought that there was a war going on between the gods of heaven and hell, which is very inaccurate and just in my mind. So this started in January. This testing is in April. And again, he started to see, we couldn't get Stephen to see a psychiatrist until the end of March. So falls ill in, in January, have um, showing psycho psychotic symptoms. At that point, um, those symptoms were delusions, um, not, not hallucinations at that point. Um, although it's reported here in April, there were, there were uh, hallucinations. We'll explore that, I think, think more thoroughly in another, in another video. So diagnostically, on page 11 of the same report by the, the Psych D here, and this again is April 2012, diagnostically, she writes, Stephen appears to meet the DSM-4 criteria for psychotic disorder NOS, which is not, other, not otherwise specified, and depressive di disorder NOS, and has most recently been diagnosed with schizophrenia form disorder. He appears to have a lifelong impairing psychiatric disorder and is currently gravely disabled. His symptoms need to be monitored and they may evolve or change. Based on these results, Stephen may display signs of loose thinking, strong and unwavering beliefs in something untrue, and may become severely depressed. What happened? So the, um, the delusional belief is exactly what She's saying here, strong and unwavering beliefs in something untrue. That's a delusional belief. In the recommendations section of the same report, um, she gives, the uh, psychologist gives 12 recommendations. I'll read six of them here. Continue with medication management is number one, with his treating child psychiatrist. And that's the one that he started seeing at the end of March and currently sees and she's uh, phenomenal, uh, incredible. She has saved. She, she has Stephen's saved life. my life. If it weren't for her, I would have ended my life at the class long ago. Right. Stephen did a, um, a video on, or we did a video. Talking about the cliffs and my suicidal thoughts. Right. And he even went back to the cliffs right. to show you where that was. Right. And 
we did a video also on clozapine and that clozapine Steve saved Stephen's life. But really it was a combination, it was ultimately his, his psychiatrist and uh, that, that did that and then the clozapine brought him back. For sure. Uh, number two, uh, this is again the, the uh, Psych D here. Parents should continue with therapy to continue to understand Stephen, Stephen's functioning and manage their feelings associated with his disorder. So what becomes critically important when a loved one uh, falls ill with a psychotic disorder. Um, and then at this point, we didn't know it was schizophrenia. Um, this is only four months in, January, February, March, April. This is four months into the first psychotic break Stephen has ever had, had ever had. Um, so January 2012, first psychotic break. Prior to that, again, we discussed there was a prodromal, you know, looking back, there was a prodromal uh, period of maybe five or six months where there was, you know, some issues with school, but he was getting straight A's, and those may have been dropping to like A minus or a B plus in a particular class. So this is nothing, nothing serious, but exhibiting some, some problems. That's what we saw. But of course, no one thought, yeah, that's schizophrenia, because no one jumps to that conclusion. Right. Quickly. And right. That's just not what you think of. No, exactly, exactly, Stephen. And, you know, it's schizophrenia, again, as we started this video, um, one of the prominent, prominent symptoms of schizophrenia is psychosis. And it's, I believe, an essential component if you're going to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so the third thing they that they've written here is when that she has written here. This is the this is the psychological report by the psych D. When Stephen can tolerate therapy, he can begin individual therapy focused on structuring his day and giving him tools to manage his anxiety. So the interesting thing here is that, you know, first thing the psych D is saying, medication management consistent with child psychiatrist recommendation. Two, parents need to, you know, as caregivers, parents need to understand what's going on with Stephen because it's, as I was alluding to earlier, it's critical for the caregiver to have an understanding of how to deal with their loved one um, in order to assist their loved one. Because when that person is um, in a psychotic situation, um, they're detached from reality. And, you know, it's, it's, it requires the caregiver to understand that first, and, and then second, to understand how to deal with that. And when not to. And when, when not. When you need your space, because if, if you need your space, especially, well, anyone can write that, but especially if you're psychotic, you need your space. Like, you need to be left alone. And even if you were coming and saying, bring me, I don't say, ice cream or something, and I was not in the right state for that, I wouldn't be happy you were giving me ice cream. I'd be like, why are you doing this? I don't want it wouldn't make sense to me the way it makes sense for you. Right. And, you know, I remember um, when Stephen became psychotic. The, the, the major break, again, in January, I can remember going on a walk out of our house with Stephen down, uh, not to the close, <laughs> down up, down, um, down our street seven or eight or nine blocks, maybe 10 blocks, uh, 20 minute walk around the neighborhood. And you were, you were psychotic. You had delusional beliefs. You didn't believe school what meant anything anymore. You were telling me um, the gods, I don't know about the gods. I don't think you were expressing anything about the gods at that point, uh, but school didn't mean anything. And, and, and life then was, was disassociated, right, from, from reality. And when we got back from the walk, um, I can remember telling Maria that we lost him. And it was, uh, it was the most, it was heartbreaking because this is something, you know, that, and this is where a lot of the stigma gets, um, um, arises from, um, you know, dealing with schizophrenia and other people looking at what schizophrenia is. Um, it's uh, 
So we were devastated. And it was, it was clear that you couldn't, you know, it wasn't going to help trying to talk him through this. Because you can't, you can't talk through reasonably with someone that has psychosis because they're not thinking reasonably. Right. And at that time, Stephen started seeing um, a therapist uh, that he no longer sees. He saw her about 20, 20 sessions in, in that, for the hospitalization. And um, that, that largely did not help because Stephen wasn't on enough medication to be able antipsychotic. Antipsychotic. Yeah, it wasn't on. So Stephen started seeing, you know, a therapist in January, February, after the the psychotic break. We tried to get Stephen into a neurologist and a psychiatrist. We were working our best to get appointments, and it was going to be two or three months to get Stephen in to see anyone. So. As we're going through this in January, and it's it's clear that Stephen has had a psychotic break and is not is not coming back, right? It's, it's just that's a fixed belief that's not shifting, and at the same time, it's it's not like there's just this fixed belief and everything else is great, and you know it's no there's 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 a there's a marked reduction or decline in function. Um, it was a delusional belief was that, that then brought on other symptoms, headaches, inability to really go outside, Stephen was staying in his room. We, I believe also, was that when I was staying up till three in the morning because I couldn't sleep? Right, not getting a lot of sleep. I remember, I, I remember that. I remember staying up three in the morning, playing Pocket Minecraft on my phone and reading A Song of Ice and Fire. So, you know. Till three think, in the morning, till I was tired enough to sleep for a little while. Not good sleep, but I was so tired I had to. So during this time, this is January 2012, we weren't, um, Stephen wasn't doing anything other than seeing a therapist, wasn't going to school, we're trying to just be here at home, uh, bring down the anxiety, don't, you know, and make Stephen as comfortable as possible. Which is also why I was playing video games and I was reading stuff maybe I shouldn't be reading at the time, but. Uh, no one was, we had to keep it so that I could be comfortable. Right. No I mean, one was going to say, you can't read that, you can't play, you can't stay up till three in the morning because I, mean, I, I had to be comfortable in some way, otherwise I would become worse. Right. So that's, that's exactly right. As this was breaking in, in January 2012, um, you know, we had to be very careful with Stephen. I mean, it was going to be pretty much okay if he wanted to stay up, you know, you know, he could stay up, essentially whatever, you know, um, something to eat, get that to eat, you know, trying to take care of things. Um, and just, you know, there was, there was put no pressure, I mean, no, there were no demands made on Stephen, there were no expectations. Um, but that didn't solve the problem at all. Things, no. things were dropping so quickly. And we, uh, as we, you know, we're trying to get him in here locally in LA County to see a psychiatrist, to see a neurologist, and it was going to be you know six, seven, eight, nine weeks. Um, we actually flew Stephen up to Children's Hospital in Oakland um, and got him to, in to see a Stanford trained neurologist up there. We have a report. This could be another video but, uh, that we'll talk about that. And that I believe was in February or the first of April. So this is like. 30 days, 45 days after the, the break, can't get him in locally. And my sister-in-law and uh, my brother had a contact at Children's Hospital, Oakland, California. And uh, Stephen and I, we flew up, uh, took a Southwest flight, flew up to, to Oakland, spent the night with my brother and, and, uh, and his wife in, in, um, in Oakland. And uh, got him into Children's Hospital the next day and then, then flew home the, the, the day after that. And you were exhibiting psychotic symptoms. We oh, didn't for know. Sure. I thought people were hunting me. I thought, I thought people were hunting me. I thought I was going to be killed. I thought there were people outside the window always watching me. So he was on a minimal amount of, um, I think it was on Seroquel. Seroquel. There was a minimal amount of uh, medication at that point had not been in to see a psychiatrist yet. Um, again, that didn't happen until the end of March 2012. So, uh, minimal amount of, uh, no, I, were you on this? 
No, you weren't. You weren't on anything at that point. That's right. You had not been. You had not been in to see a psychiatrist. We weren't point. able to. No, that's correct. So no medication at that point. And actually, that's right. The, the doctor over there, neurologist, who's a neurologist, uh, Stanford trained, and uh, Mike, uh, Stephen, and I saw him for about ninety minutes. In his in, there at the hospital, um, and he did a kind of a, a examination of Stephen, and no inflammation in the head. We thought maybe. It, Head injuries, some kind of right, or a brain disease, brain. some type of brain disease, um, and he, he saw no inflammation, and thought that uh, that uh, a small amount of seroquel might help, but that you needed that you needed to get you know we needed to get him into see a psychiatrist um, immediately, immediately. So so that um, that's how it progressed um, until we saw the psychiatrist. But going back to to eight to eight. Uh, April, yes, 2012. Um, due to Steve's impairment, he will. Oh, the other, the, one of the other items on the, the report by the Psych D here, uh, item number five. Due to Steve's impairment, this is again April 2012. He's, he did a full psychological evaluation of Stephen. She did. Due to Steve's impairment, he will need an IEP plan in place. So, an IEP plan is a um, is a special education plan in a public school. Stephen was not enrolled. In in a public school at that point. He's, I was in the Catholic school. Right, he was in a Catholic private school. And so, I have to look back in our records, but it was very quickly, either late January or February, but by this time, April of 2012, after the, the break, I enrolled Stephen, or we enrolled Stephen, in the uh, public, local public uh, school system, middle school, um, knowing that that would be necessary for us to get um, special ed support and therapeutic support from the school district. So we did do that. And Stephen ultimately went into an IEP program and transferred about a year later to the public school system. And the sixth, the sixth thing here is education for parents regarding the inability of this, the instability. So the sixth thing here that the uh, psychologist has written is that uh, is education, again, these are recommendations on, on what Stephen's gonna need, Education for parents regarding the instability of this potentially lifelong disorder and long-term planning. So this, that is the psychological evaluation she did. It was, again, by a Psych D clinical psychologist specializing in comprehensive educational and psychological assessment of children, um, adolescents, and adults in uh, April of uh, 2012. And something I found on the web. According to Wikipedia.org, 2012 was a 2009 American epic science fiction disaster film directed and written by Roland Emmerich. Oh, this is terrible. Okay, in case that somehow is left in, <laughs> please excuse our Alexa for what it just said. Yeah, we apologize for that in case this is left in the video. Yeah. No, it won't be left in. It won't be left in. Just in case. That's cute. Okay, I got that. So. Okay. Also, that gives me time to cut. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's terrible. Yeah. Terrible timing. So, so this, so that's the psychological evaluation, um, in April of 2012. Done by a clinical a psychologist, a psych D. So Stephen then is hospitalized on May 17th at UCLA Resnick Neuropsychiatric. Which I've already done a video on if you want to learn more about that. So I'm going to read you um, a letter from his psychiatrist. This is the current psychiatrist that he has, the one that he started seeing in May, or March rather, 2012. Um, and it's her letter to, well, to whom it may concern, but it's actually um, in support of his hospitalization because what happened in the hospitalization was that on March 17th in the morning Stephen and I were seeing the psychiatrist here locally and Stephen was we were both in seeing her at the same time and Stephen was describing a incredible this incredible delusional belief system of the gods that he felt he was part of. And 
um, it, this had really started about a few days before that. Um, we were seeing her two or three times a week at this point. It was, it was, it was Stephen was dropping so quickly. His, his functional ability was dropping. And his delusional belief system was not abating. It was just getting stronger. Yes. And he was on, um, he was on a um, small amount, I believe, of Abilify at that point. I think it was like two milligrams a day. Small amount. And he had also been, in, or maybe also was on um, a small amount of Seroquel, which is also a second generation antipsychotic, but a very small amount. 100 milligrams, uh, which is actually a small amount for that for that drug. It was after that morning session with his psychiatrist on May 17th that Stephen and I came home, and he was suicidal. Um, it was not homicidal, and you know people are scared of schizophrenia. We're going to go in much more to destigmatize schizophrenia because you know someone with a psychotic illness right which is a symptom of schizophrenia that's scary for us right we don't understand that we hadn't as parents understood it prior to Stephen coming down with a psychotic illness um, and it's important and I think incumbent upon us to educate um, others about um, psychosis um, because I think largely it's it's a self it's going to be self harm. It's not going to be harm. For other the people. most part, we are not going to hurt anyone other than ourselves. Right. Right. I I never saw the point hurting someone else, but I definitely saw the point of hurting myself. Well, I say that not hurting myself. I didn't see a point in that. Some some people do commit self harm, but I thought. Well, you know, my life's terrible. It's not getting any better. It's just getting worse. I'm stressed all the time. I'm in pain. Why am I living? I never thought I'd hurt someone else. I did thought I'd end my life to move on from that pain. Right. Interesting. So that's what you were feeling. And, and so Stephen was suicidal. He wasn't, he wasn't taking any measures on himself at that point and, and has never taken any measures, you know, no, cutting only, himself or anything. No, no. So that's never, that. that's never occurred. It was um, only in my mind that I was... Planning out my different ways I wanted, and, uh, but, but I never acted on it. Either. When when Stephen and I came home from that May seventeenth in the morning, for that May seventeenth uh, appointment with his psychiatrist, it was clear that we had to get Stephen in to the hospital because he was seriously delusional and suicidal, and so I didn't feel we didn't feel that we could maintain Stephen here uh, safely. So, I took him on that afternoon, May 17th, Stephen and I got in the car, and I took him and we drove to the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Hospital. And the, you, uh, the hospital is actually on the fourth floor of the Ronald Reagan Medical Center. And it's a separate entity, it's a separate hospital, Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital at UCLA. It's on the fourth floor. You enter, though, through the emergency room uh, of at the Ronald Reagan Medical Center at UCLA. So, and I knew this because I had been talking to um, the intake nurses, both at the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Hospital prior to this, and uh, UCI has a, um, a uh, neuropsychiatric department. I don't know the extent. There's a very small department there uh, with eight or nine beds, I think. So they have a program at UCI, that's the University of California at Irvine. And I've been speaking also to some of the nurses, the intake nurses at UCI. But I wanted to get Stephen, if we had to take him anywhere, into the UCLA program because it is top notch. It's a very good hospital. And they service 80 to 100, they have 80 to 100 uh, psychiatric beds. That can, that means that those, they can take about 80 to 100 people um, at any one given time they come in. So I took Steve on the afternoon, May 17th. We drove to the hospital, went in through the emergency room, and Stephen was seen by a um, on-duty psychiatrist down at the, on the first floor in the emergency room. And it was a couple hours later after you saw her that they admitted Stephen um, to the neuropsychiatric hospital. 
And Steve was, again, stayed for two weeks. But the insurance company wanted to discharge him after two days. So, and this was Anthem Blue Cross. We're keeping, you know, names and names uh, confidential um, and respecting people's confidentiality. This is kind of confidentiality, but this is an insurance company. So it was Anthem Blue Cross. And on day two of his admission, that's on, on uh, May 19th, they, they, Anthem is telling the psychiatrist at UCLA that they're not going to pay for the hospitalization any further. He needs to be discharged. The psychiatrists are saying, no, no, no. I mean, Stephen is seriously ill, and this is going to take some time. No, nothing's changed in the last 48 hours. Your condition did not change at all. He said, he's at a great hospital, but nothing has changed in, it, in his functioning. Identical situations, not like you know, they had not fixed anything. And they had confirmed that he had serious um, suicidal um, beliefs and also that he had these firm delusions. So I'm going to read a, so what happened is um, we agreed you know, to obviously continue having him there and that you know, we would pay for it. Um, we ultimately had to fight the insurance company and the insurance company did pay for the full two weeks. But, so this is a letter written, I'm going to read this letter, this portion of this letter. This is a letter written on June 1st, right after his discharge, by his current psychiatrist, right? not the psychiatrist in UCLA, but his current psychiatrist and the psychiatrist then, um, supporting the need for his hospitalization. And this will give an insight into um, what his psychiatrist understood his, his delusional thinking to be. In this, again, with it being, uh, this is June 1st, but this would be his delusional thinking in, in May of 2012. And she writes, Stephen has been under my care for the treatment of a complex neuropsychiatric disorder since March 27th, 2012. While he initially presented with depression, his clinical picture quickly deteriorated and was characterized by psychotic symptoms. He became paranoid and developed a delusional system in which he was under the control of evil gods. He began to hear voices, which he was sure were evil. On May 17, 2012, she writes, I interviewed Stephen and his father. In that session, Stephen showed that he had deteriorated markedly. He was much more delusional and was hearing voices. So you've got the delusions here, and then you have the auditory, auditory hallucinations. He, start, he stated that he was, quote, pretty sure the voices were evil. God is evil. I was a servant. I stopped being a servant. God changed me to nothing. I am being controlled. I am not human. Close quote. When I asked Stephen if the voices were telling him to hurt himself or anyone else, Stephen paused and thought about it. He answered slowly that they were not at the present time. I instructed the father to increase Stephen's Zyprexa to five milligrams. We covered this a little bit in the um, in the, uh, the closet roll, closet pain uh, video, that um, his psychiatrist. This is at the end of March and into April. You now this is in, in the first part of May as well. I think it was in May it had 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 switched from a small amount of Abilify to Zyprexa. And so when he, when I took Stephen to the neuropsychiatric hospital on May 17, 2012, he was on five milligrams of Zyprexa. And they continued with that, um, as I stated in an earlier video, uh, at the hospital for the two weeks. And they titrated him up to 15 milligrams. And then he was discharged, and then we continued that for a period of time. Again, that didn't, um, it, it didn't, it loosened maybe the, some of the, the delusions, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, resolve. So lastly, the psychiatrist writes in the letter of June 1st, 2012, there is no question that Stephen has a severe psychiatric disorder, which required inpatient hospitalization to prevent, prevent him from harming himself. So Stephen, let's pause there and then come back. See how you... No, let's go. So what, so Stephen, um, 
in listening to this, this um, the way your psychiatrist wrote, um, it supported your hospitalization back in May of 2012. What are your thoughts? It's scary. I don't remember almost any of that. It's just, it's, it's, it's scary. There's no way I can put it. Right. Um, and one, one of the things is that, you know, um, I'm sure that, you know, I want to know as well, I, that everyone, that my hearing is, uh, do you currently have any, those delusional beliefs? No, I have no delusions anymore. I have no hallucinations any longer. I, I don't believe that I am nothing. I don't believe that I am being controlled. I don't hear voices. So see the amazing uh, work that the psychiatrist has done and very amazing. And that Clause of Pain has done. Yes. Because uh, Stephen does not, is not reporting any delusional beliefs or hallucination, mm -hmm. hallucinations. And that has been the case for about five years, maybe six. And uh, so we had, Stephen's been very stable for a very long time now. Yes. Only had the one hospitalization. And it is quite remarkable given his, his um, the deteriorating. Severity. The severity of my illness. Correct. Given the severity of Stephen's illness, it's quite remarkable that he only had the one two week hospitalization for this illness. And I, mean, I credit that to the medicine and my psychiatrist. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my parents for helping me with right. keeping things relatively low stress here. Right. Reducing stress, reducing anxiety. That was that's always been, you know, the the, the pillar of what his psychiatrist has recommended for him and for us uh, to do. And so we have followed um, that uh, to a T. And it's worked. Yeah, and it has worked, you know. It's just an amazing thing, you know. And um, so what, when when someone hears that, that a loved one has schizophrenia or a friend or they hear about someone suffering from schizophrenia, and again, it's the word I, I said, I think I said this in one of the first videos, that it's, you know, it's feared. It's, and, you know, schizophrenia is feared. But, but this is schizophrenia, so it's interesting. It's not... There's not always delusions and hallucinations that last forever. No. Now some people, I mean, are, you know, are the first two years that, of Stephen's illness uh, was really a nightmare uh, well, for Stephen and for us as his parents, because I was not certain at all whether Stephen would ever come out of it, ever, and it it was just this dark, dark, deep hole. Stephen wasn't going to hurt anybody. And that's a very big misconception. Right. He wasn't going to hurt anybody. He's going to potentially hurt himself, right? That, yes. That was you know, jumping off the cliffs or something. He wasn't going to hurt anybody. And he wasn't, um, but it wasn't just, you know, delusions and hallucinations and then, hey, everything's, you know, then going back, you know, to school and everything. No, he And I saw it. empathy as well. Part of the reason why I didn't jump off the cliff was because I didn't want some children or someone to find me they're dead, because that would traumatize them. I didn't want that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's great. That's great. The, yeah. yeah. So, so when you hear about someone that has schizophrenia, and then, you know, you're looking at Stephen, no delusions, and no psychosis, sorry. Currently no psychosis, and has not had any psychosis in about six years. It's been a very long time. Um, Just please don't be afraid of us. That's all I have to say. There. Just don't be afraid. Right. We aren't going to hurt you. And that's what you know. We we want to in part do. I think it, uh, that's obviously what Stephen wants to do through this, and we we through these videos, and we as his parents do as well. Stephen has made incredible progress, and has not had any psychosis for approximately six years, maybe over six years. And we're just so proud of you, Stephen and how you've, you've recovered from your psychotic break and from that long period of psychosis. Very long period. Very long period. And so we want to thank you, know, you for listening to these videos. Definitely. Watching these videos. Yeah. And uh, joining 
us on this journey. Yes. Really appreciate you being here. Absolutely do. So, yeah, that's it for this video. Uh, I hope you have a happy and healthy rest of your day, and we we'll hope to see you in the next video. Have a great day. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.